Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Gary V. John, how are you? Really good. Hey, who's going to buy EVs? We're going to find out today. We're going to find out today. Exactly right. So tell the, tell the audience who we've got on the show today. All right. So we've got Casey Boyce, who is the Vice President of Automotive and Mobility and Energy. It's quite a long title to fit on a card. Uh, at a, it is. At a company called Escalant. So thanks for being here, Casey. Thanks for having me. Really a and pleasure. And we've got, we've got our good, dear friend, Paul Eisenstein of Headlight.news, if I got that correctly, You got Paul. it right. Thank yeah. you. New website. Check it out for sure. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Casey, I got to tell you, uh, and for the audience too, I was so thrilled when Gary arranged to have you come on the show because I think Escalant has done the best market research into the mindset of car buyers and especially how you guys look at different segments of the car buying population to try to figure out who's really going to buy EVs. Yeah. So wh why don't you run us through a little bit of, of, of that market segmentation? Sure. So let me give you a little bit of background first. So the, the segmentation comes out of a study called EV Forward. And what we're trying to do is really understand where buyers are on their journey towards electrification, right? So we're looking at the entire market, people who own EVs, all the way to people who say, I am never going to buy an EV. You're never going to even force me to take the keys to one, right? You so everyone in my between. cold, dead fingers off my eyes. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we, what we want to do with that, uh, that whole population is really understand motivations around EV and kind of where people are at, right? And so since, since you last had a, a colleague of mine on the show, we've actually updated our segmentation. Uh, so we've got six new segments that we looked at. Uh, and one of the big changes from what we last did is that technology has become quite a bit more of a motivator for a number of different segments. So the, the consumer group that's closest to buying an EV is what we call trailblazers. And these people, they're very motivated by new things. So EV scene is new. They're very motivated by technology. And so they see EV as the vehicle, no pun intended, for having really innovative in-vehicle technology. Uh, and they're really motivated by the environment. So they see EV as kind of a green uh, thing that they can do personally. So the next segment down, kind of next closest to buying an EV is what we call the altruist. And these customers aren't car people at all, but they do care about the environment. They think climate change is a big issue. They want to do something to help. And so for them, they're interested in EVs because they're like, okay, that can help with climate change, but they need a little bit of handholding around some of the practical aspects of owning an EV. Unlike the trailblazers who will go do a lot of self-education, they need to know you know, what's the range on this thing look like? Where do I charge? How do I charge at home? What's the battery life look like? All of these kind of practical considerations that people have. Mm -hmm. The next group down, uh, which is fairly close in terms of their likelihood to buy an EV to the altruist, but very different motivations are the techies. As you might expect, they're driven by technology, right? Um, they are not as fully sold on EVs as the trailblazers, though, so they still need a little convincing that EVs are going to work long term, right? It's an interesting idea, going to take a look at it, but this isn't where we're headed for sure, for sure, right? The next group is actually my favorite. Uh, we call them the dreamers. And what's interesting about them is that in many ways, they look like the trailblazers, right? They, they care about the environment. They care about tech. They want a fun vehicle. They're car people. Uh, they're very interested in EVs, but they're in this place in their lives that, you know, they, they have kids, right? So they're running into soccer practice or hockey practice. Um, they're, you know, stretched in terms of paying for kids' education and, and other things. So they might want the sports car, but they're going to end up in the mid-sized SUV, right? So th they're dreaming of the thing that they want. They may not get it for a little while, right? Uh, and then we've got the pragmatists who are very practical transportation point A to point B. You know, if you can convince me that an EV will do that, I might listen, but I know the gas car will do that. And that's kind of where my head is at. And then we've got the traditionalists and they're more of the, you know, prime my ice uh, uh, keys out of my cold dead hand kind of people. Climate change, not an issue, not interested in new technology. They like their trucks. They're kind of good with the way things are. So those are our six segments that we've got at a high level. Do, do you have percentages? I mean, is, is the dreamer group 13% and the altruists 
by, I mean. Yeah, so we do, and it's fairly evenly split. So it's not exactly, you know, 18% or so for each of those groups, but it's clustered around that. Uh, the uh, dreamer and the techie and the altruist are kind of the largest group. So a little bit uh, higher than 20% or so each, and then sort of spread out a little bit lower among the other three. Have we seen a shift over the last few years, or as long as you've been doing this study, uh, or the EV, the EV positive, or at least the EV open type of buyers growing or shrinking? Uh, and are there things that will move people back and forth? Yeah. So one of the really interesting things that we saw for the first time last year in the study is that when we looked at the trending, we had been seeing growth in what we call EV intenders. So these are consumers that sit in any persona that they're likely to buy an EV for their next vehicle. And we've gone back and tested, they're about 15 and a half, 16 times more likely to buy an EV than the average consumer is. Uh, and so when we started the study in 2020, it was 16% of the market. Last year, it was 25% of the market. We're getting ready to release our 2024 study. It dips slightly down to 24%, but that's still roughly a quarter of the market that's an that's EV around, intender. That could be a rounding error as opposed to It, real, it could real be. Uh, and we can talk a little bit if we want to about kind of where the state of the consumer cycle like he is on EV, but, but we've seen that growth. And in the first couple of years of the study, what we saw is that the EV resistant consumer, people who aren't likely to consider an EV regardless, even if they're introduced to one, that group had been shrinking and the EV open had been staying uh, basically the same. And then we'd seen that growth in EV intent. So people were kind of moving through from EV resistant to EV open to EV and tender. Mm -hmm. Last year, what happened is that the EV open shrank and EV and tender climb and EV resistance stayed the same. So what essentially was happening is that people were kind of on the fence about EV for a couple of years, right? That mm -hmm. I'll consider it. I'd like to learn more, you know, may or may not work for me. And then last year we, we started to see some polarization where people are either saying I'm going EV for my next car, or there's no way that's going to work. I'm not even going to consider it. So we're starting to see a little bit more of that in the consumer. All right. So just one follow up on that. Uh, I, I've talked with a few other data trackers. Yeah. Uh, J.D. Power in particular, uh, one of the gentlemen who I speak to regularly said that he saw a big shift last spring that also coincided with what he saw happening in the mainstream media. Uh, and for several years, mainstream media seemed to be just lapping it up. EVs are the most wonderful thing in the world. And yet, it, about that time, I noticed the same thing. I've heard it from other people. Suddenly, a lot of the, the Newsweeks or, or Entertainment Tonight, you know, all these right. places suddenly started picking up on the negative propaganda, mm -hmm. wherever it came from. And he started seeing a data shift, a fairly rapid shift in some segments of the market going from either EV pro or EV neutral to, in some cases, very harshly anti-EV. Did you see something like that? We didn't see something that's quite as stark as what you described. So certainly we've seen you know, some of that tone shift in the mainstream mm -hmm. media, but what we see is that most people don't pay attention to the media the way that probably the four of us do. We might right? as well leave, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that doesn't include the audience. Either. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, present company included, right? Um, but, uh, you know, when we ask people about, you know, whether they've read anything about EVs, it's roughly half of new car buyers. So, I mean, still a decent chunk of folks, right? And we are seeing some of those things like, you know, concerns about fires and, you know, sustainability of sourcing materials and all of those kind of concerns um, showing up in what people are saying. But overall, we're seeing still a move in the positive direction in terms of sentiment around EVs. And really the only parts of the population that are kind of, they aren't even really moving more negatively. They're just staying in sort of a negative, uh, uh, you know, perception of EVs is the older customers and truck intenders, mm -hmm. um, which there's a fairly high overlap between those two groups. Yeah. But that's kind of where we're seeing that negative sentiment. And we ran a study actually at the end of last year because, you know, as, as we all know, the industry press was talking about, oh my gosh, you know, EVs are never going to sell. The, the days of growth are over. The sky is falling. And we wanted to see whether consumers were picking up on that, right? Like we're all talking about it. Right. And what we found is 
consumers weren't seeing it. So, you know, 42% felt like EVs were moving in a positive direction. Um, you had another 30 or 40% that were saying, you know, they're, they're kind of the same way that they were, and only a few that were saying that they're moving in a more negative direction. Consumers were saying automakers are selling as many as they can make. Automakers are making a profit on every EV. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, we can dissect a little bit in terms of whether it's true or not. But in terms of the consumer psyche, they're kind of looking at it and saying, yeah, no, it's kind of full steam ahead here. Hmm. All right. So, so let me quote you to you. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> And I see didn't, if you agree. Yeah, I didn't yeah. say it. So. <laughs> Despite there being more EV models with higher range and lower prices, EV sales growth for much of the year, meaning this year, this year, yep, will be relatively slow compared to what we saw in 22, 23. Assuming that interest rates moderate, we will see an explosion of EV sales in the late 24 as consumers feel more comfortable with payments in vehicles with the NAX port become available. So break that down for us and tell me if you still believe that to be true. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Yes, I still believe that to be true. Um, but let me back up to why we're making the statement there, or why, you know, why I think that we're going to see this relatively slow growth through much of this year. When we look at consumers and whether they say they'd be willing to wait for the right BEV, every year that we've run the study, it's climbed. And it's now 40% of the market that says, I'm going to wait. So if you're not having to buy a new car today, you're sitting on the sidelines. And there's a couple of things that are causing people to sit on the sidelines. One is model availability, right? If you're a Toyota loyalist and you want a sedan, there's not a Toyota EV sedan. There's not even a great Toyota EV SUV if you're an SUV person. Um, so having product that is compelling to people uh, is really important. Now that's changing, right? There's been kind of this Cambrian explosion of EV models. So there are more brands, more segments that are available, but there still are some uh, gaps in the market. The second thing is the economy. So we actually ran a global study last year uh, that looked into, we've, we're calling it the, the quality of living crisis, right? Because it's a kind of a combination of inflation and people saying, I'm cutting back as a result. So we saw something like 40% of consumers in the US who said, I'm not spending money on things that buy me joy. That's like an ice cream or going to the movie, right? Um, now those people aren't all necessarily new car buyers, but people are feeling the cost of living, right? You add increased uh, in, uh, interest rates, right? Which are making payments higher. You add that EVs are more expensive than ICE cars. Last I saw was about a $5,000 differential that has been coming down, but it's still there. And so from an economic standpoint, this kind of feeds into this idea of if I don't have to buy now, I'm going to wait, see what happens. Now, if the Fed brings the interest rates down, that changes the multi-payment dynamics. Uh, of course, the tax credit dynamics have changed. You can now put the cash on the hood at the dealership. You've got more and more captive finance that are you know, running it through and leasing. So that helps there. And then the, the third piece is the NAX transition. So when Ford made the announcement last year and then everyone kind of followed pretty quickly that they were going to be adopting uh, the Tesla port or J3400 now, I guess, as it's called, um, what we saw was consumers saying, that's great. We don't like standards wars. So good on you, automotive industry, for like coming together around a single standard. Um, but they also are saying, again, if I don't have to buy a vehicle today, mm -hmm. I'm going to wait until I can buy the car that has the port built in, which, you know, as far as my understanding, and you all may know more, it's going to be kind of model year 25 is when we start seeing that happening. So those three factors together are really causing a lot of people to sit on the sidelines. And so, again, assuming nothing crazy happens with the economy and the Fed follows through with uh, bringing the interest rates down, once we start seeing those models with the NAX port built in, I think we're going to see a lot of pent up demand showing up in the sales numbers. Casey, last year, uh, EV sales in the U.S. were a little over a million, almost yep. 1.1 1. 1 million. Yep. We had Warren Brown, who's a forecaster, uh, uh, on the show, what, a month ago or something like that. And his prediction for this year was 1.59 million EVs. You think that's realistic? Well, we don't have a light duty EV forecast, so I don't have any okay. data to, okay. to kind of back think up. It could grow that much. I think potentially. I mean, what we're looking at is, you know, we expect we'll end up somewhere around 10% uh, of sales this year will be EV. So that'd be sure. a million five. You know, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. we're running it at 15 you're talking, five to exactly. 16 you're, million. You you're share it, talking yeah. pure Bev. Pure Bev. And correct. that's the retail or is that overall? US that's market? retail. 
Okay, so so so, so yes. <laughs> so so to this point, put some some numbers on it. Yeah. Um, so um, Cox Automotive came out yesterday with their uh, automotive dealer sentiment index, where they they look and see how dealers are feeling about how things are going. So um, there's a quote embedded in their announcement yesterday, but I want to precede it with a quote that was made in. January 16th by the same person. So mm -hmm. Valerie Valdez Stretti, who is the director of industry insights at Cox Automotive said, Americans bought a record shattering 1,189,051 electric vehicles. You were damn close um, last year. And we expect that growth to continue in the future. In yesterday's release, she said, in 2024, Cox Automotive's team expects the industry to fully acknowledge the fact that the average consumer needs to be convinced on the merits of going electric and many won't be easily persuaded. The EV market is likely to see a rise in the number of models, incentives, discounting and advertising. However, selling more EVs will require more effort on the parts of dealers. So whether you're going to be able to get that bump is going to be a lot of heavy lifting at dealerships. Do you see that? being a requirement? It's always at the dealerships, right? I mean, that's where we buy cars, except for Teslas. Um, so yes, and, and I think going back to where people are at, um, you know, a lot of the early adopters didn't need some of that hand-holding, right? They came into the dealership, they knew more than the salespeople about the vehicles, about where to charge, about how to take care of the battery. They weren't put off by the fact that EVs cost $10,000 more than an equivalent ICE model. The consumer that's going into a dealership today, by and large, is not in that same place, right? Like I talked about the altruist and how they're not car people. They're motivated to buy an EV, but they need some of that handholding from the dealer uh, about what life with an EV is like. And that's really where people are looking for that information, right? We work with a lot of energy utilities and many of them like to say, okay, you know, we're talking electric vehicles, so they're going to come talk to us. And what we see when we talk to consumers is, no, they're not. Um, they're going to talk to the dealer. That's where they want to get information. So yes, there's a lot of heavy lifting that needs to happen at the dealer because the buyers that are coming into showrooms today won't have done as much of that self-education or maybe need a little bit more of reassurance from the self-education that they've done uh, about what life with a VEV is going to look like. See, I yeah, think it starts see, before that, actually. One, 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 two, yeah. Because dealers order the cars that go on the lots. True. It's not the customers who yeah. do it. You know, it's the complete opposite right. of the Tesla model, right? And so unless dealers order EVs, you know, uh, there's not going to be EVs for customers to go in and shop for. You know, unless car companies can say, hey, you want those uh, F-150s? You got to take all these Mach-E's and Lightnings with it. But uh, I, I, to me, the real challenge is going to be getting dealers to order these cars in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I definitely see some of those dynamics, right? We've heard dealers say that they have uh, big concerns about uh, kind of the EV sales trajectory and whether some of the policy goals are achievable. Um, I think there is, um, I'll say in certain areas of the country, enough demand that there's kind of a, a snowball uh, effect and you're going to get dealers who are following the market saying, yeah, I've got to order the Mach-E's and the, the Lightning." I've talked about it on this show. Now, this is in the Detroit area. I, I can't say another. I know three people whose dealerships tried to talk them out of buying an EV. In fact, in one case, refused to even order an EV for a what? customer who wanted to buy one. Right. <laughs> and yet we did over a million units last yeah, year. Right. So, right. so <laughs> what, what happens if dealers say, hey, let's try to sell these things? Right, exactly. And I, I think, again, you know, one of the things that we see in terms of the consumer dynamic is that when you know someone with an EV, that has a big impact on your intent to buy. And so that's why I said in certain areas of the country, you look at California where, you know, a quarter of new vehicle sales are EVs pretty sure you're going to know someone, right? right? As opposed to North Dakota, where it's, you know, what, Never 1% happen. or something like that. Right. So, yeah. So, so you're, you're touching on something which I think is a pretty interesting phenomenon. Uh, Power and a couple others have said that there's a distinct difference with your contact with either an EV or an EV owner. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't remember the exact percentages, uh, but within the last six months, Power came out with a number. Uh, it showed that if you have had serious experience with an EV, you've driven it, maybe you previously owned it, you may know people, mm -hmm. you are, if you will, up here. Yeah. Uh, if you have ridden in an EV, mm -hmm. but have never driven it, you drop. 
Mm -hmm. And if you have no experience with an EV, you're slightly above ground level. Right. Are you seeing the same thing? And so is the industry, is one of the important things for the industry, if that's true, finding a way to get butts and seats. That is exactly what we suggest is butts and seats because we're seeing the same thing. And, you know, I think when, when you look at a prospective buyer, they know gas. They've grown up with gas. It's just been kind of in the air, right? You know how to fuel it. You know literally. how to deal with it. Yeah, literally in the air. Um, and we're talking about a different powertrain. We're talking about a different way of fueling. We're talking about a different way of traveling. And people naturally have questions and, and people are naturally uncertain, right? Like, I, I, you know, there's no reason to uh, look down on someone who, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I've been an EV driver for a decade. My mom was riding with me in, in my first EV, I think, and it had recently rained and we were driving through a puddle and she says, can you drive these things through a puddle? Of course, the answer is yes, but it's a reasonable question for somebody to have, right? And so there, there's all of these little things. And I think that's where having the butts in seats, having knowing someone so you can ask someone, a you know, a quote unquote stupid question that you might feel bad about at the dealership, but you might ask your son or whoever Again, they're reasonable questions and people just want to understand what this is. So that experience is really critical. Well, one, one more thing. Um, um, we, we have a tendency as media, and a lot of the studies I see from, from folks in your position, mm -hmm. talk about the things that don't sell EVs, range anxiety, pricing, charging anxiety, and so on. What are the things that are clicking? What are the things that you're seeing Maybe it's a case of somebody in a lower level of interest in EV adoption that when they suddenly find this, they go. You're saying like the compelling, yeah. the aha yeah. moment. Yeah. Yes. So the, the one thing that, well, okay, let me back up for a second. You know, the things that people expect of EVs are not necessarily ahas, right? They expect savings in terms of operational costs, right? Electricity costs less than gas. They expect environmental benefits, EVs cleaner than gas, not really an aha. I think for us, the big aha is this idea of not having to go to a gas station again, right? People do it in their day-to-day -day life. They don't complain about it because you've got to do it. But when they say, wait a minute, I never have to go out of my way to get gas again, that's kind of cool. And we've seen this over and over again in focus groups. We've seen it in the quantitative data where that really resonates with people in a way that, that some of these other things, yeah, yeah, it's environmentally friendly, but that's nice, right? <laughs> Versus I don't have to go to a gas station again. That's really a, a great benefit to me. So that's one of the big things that's clicking. You know, and performance, interior space. I mean, most EVs, with rare exception, you're going to get class above interior space. Uh, a lot of people I talk to who like it, one of the things that, and this is anecdotal, mm -hmm. but I hear people go, oh my God, it's just instant power. They don't necessarily say torque. So I know that there are a lot of things, again, back to the butts and seats. Once you get in, you discover, wow, this is pretty cool. And I think that's where the experience really matters because when we look at some of the expectations of EV owners and non-owners, the EV owners pick up on things like the experience, uh, the the interior space. They pick up on things like the acceleration, um, and the non EV owners, it's not really on their radar, right? So if you can have that firsthand experience and know, oh, this will throw me in the back of the seat, or at least it'll beat the guy next to me off the the line at the stoplight, then you start to get it and see those benefits that the EV owners are recognizing. But it's that's not something that's kind of entered the, the mainstream consciousness in the same way that, oh, I don't have to go to the gas station has. But, but, to, but to the people who are worried about taking their kids to school and getting to work reliably, as they would say, hmm, I'll buy a Toyota because I'll be able to do those yeah. things without a problem. I mean, do they think about things like performance? Um, you know, when you get into an EV, yes, you can have incrementally larger space because of the the layout but i mean it isn't like you're you're in you know a suddenly uh an auditorium i mean it's it's no but aside, people it, spend money to go up from an interior that's subcompact to a compact or even a compact plus and you see that i mean look at look at some of the ones out there an ionic for example get in the back seat of an ionic six and tell me about all the legroom you got there 
Well, that's a design issue. Same with the Mercedes. Well, exactly. But I mean, there's always there's always a violation of the rule. You, you know, I don't think people, uh, the, the general public, you know, uh, buy a car based on zero to sixty times. Definitely not on quarter mile times or anything like that. They don't. It's not even off the line. It's when you you've got that. Hey, I want to move into uh, the spot in traffic right now boom in an ev you're right there mm -hmm. there's no mash the pedal get the transmission to kick down get right. the engine to rev, rev and it's instantaneous yeah and it's that ease of driving where all of a sudden you realize wow this thing's so easy to drive i think when you say performance i believe that's where the general public is going to say you know i really like the performance of this it's not off the line acceleration it's being able to move around in traffic or you know, merging onto the highway or you're pulling out and here comes the garbage truck barreling down and yeah. you got to get going and boom, you're gone. That's the kind of performance I think that's going to convince the general public so day that an EV is a better driving experience. And I will say potentially even non-car people, yes, right? No, so No, that's what I mean, yeah, non-car yeah. people. Because, uh, you know, my, another quick story, my wife is also an EV owner. She drives an e-golf, so not the quickest accelerating EV. I think zero to 60 in, I don't know, tomorrow. seven and a half. It's yeah. not tomorrow, but it's it's not as quick as most EVs. But she loves being able to beat cars off the, the stop line. And she's not a performance-minded person at all, right? Um, but she loves that instant torque and that ability in cut and thrust kind of around town driving. And again, we see that in the data that EV owners really value that. It's not really on the radar of anyone else. So what if your wife had a GTI? Wouldn't she have the same performance? Possibly, but then she wouldn't be driving an EV. No. <laughs> But it'd still be a Volkswagen. <laughs> it'd still be a Golf. I'll let you talk to her. How about that? Yeah. Okay. So, so but what I wonder about is, is, is this behavioral change that, yeah. you know, you guys looked at, at people taking road trips mm -hmm. and, you know, for people who are driving gasoline powered vehicles, as you said, you know, gas stations are everywhere. Yeah. They're ubiquitous. Charge stations aren't. So, so talk to us a little about, about what you discovered, the way people take trips and what would facilitate they're buying an EV to make taking these trips easier. Yeah. So most people take road trips at least once a year. I mean, there's, you know, a third of, of people who say they never go more than, you know, 400 miles or so in a year, but most people take a, a trip at least once a year. And again, many people, they know what that looks like in a gas car, right? Um, there is a lot of uncertainty around what it might look like in an EV that really is sticking in people's minds here. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of how that plays out in a moment. But one of the really interesting things that we found is that when people take road trips, almost everybody stops at least once, maybe multiple times on a 400 plus mile road trip. And the average length of their stop, 26 minutes. Huh. Yeah. So bathroom breaks, getting, bathroom, something getting to get, eat. yeah, getting something I need, to eat. I need to get that data. Yeah. So, so when you look at it objectively, can an EV work in that scenario? Maybe not a bolt, but certainly like an Ionic six, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's that uncertainty because they don't know what it's going to look like in the Ionic six. They do know what it is going to look like in their Santa Fe. Right. Um, and there's a couple of things that play into that. Uh, one is that. EV charging infrastructure is not visible, right? Gas stations, you've got big signs plastered over the highway. You've got, you know, the blue signs on the side of the highway telling you there's a shell and a BP coming up. There's none of that for EV, right? right? And a lot of the, at least the older infrastructure, the industry has been getting better on this. It's a, a kind of the beige utility box with wires stuck in the back corner of a parking lot somewhere. So if you don't know that it's an EV charger, you have no idea. It's just some utility thing over there, right? So, you know, that visibility is really critical. And, and that, by the way, is one of the things that helps drive EV intent as well as awareness of charging infrastructure. Um, but coming back to the idea of road trips, it's it's one, that visibility, and then two, being able to route to it, right? So. It's really only been fairly recently that other OEMs have caught up with Tesla, which had route planning basically from day one, where you say, this is where I want to go. And it says, okay, you got to stop at this supercharger and this supercharger and this supercharger and you're done, right? Um, so that's a big thing, how technology can enable these road trips and provide some of that certainty. In the absence of that certainty, 
what people want is an EV with huge range because they're saying if I do 400 miles, an EV with 450 miles means I can just go straight through and I don't have to stop and I don't have to worry about finding infrastructure, worrying about whether it's broken, worrying about how do I charge this thing. Like I just, I just go right. So there's a lot that people have to just really get some reassurances on in being able to use an EV in the road trip. And these are all solvable issues, right? The infrastructure is worlds better than when I first bought an EV. It still has issues, but it's, it's a lot better. Um, but it's that confidence that buyers need for them to be able to say, okay, I'm going to spend $50,000 on an EV because I know it's going to meet not just my day to day, but it's going to meet those road trip needs. I, yeah, wait, I wait, run, hold on. Yeah. Once I, hold that thought, Paul, because we got to take a quick commercial break for our great sponsor, Bridgestone. Keeping your heart racing in and out of the gym. That's what really matters. Bridgestone Potenza Sport AS tires with a 50,000 mile limited warranty. All right, we're back talking about who's going to buy EVs and who is not. And Paul, you had a question. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I have an F-150 Lightning. Okay. And there have been times where I've been a little bit hesitant in certain directions whether I want to take that or some other vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, going up north, uh, I had reports of a lot of defective or malfunctioning mm -hmm. chargers. And I think that's one of the biggest things. I think people are become, becoming aware that the reliability is as much an issue as availability. And until they fix that, until you know not only you can find a charger, but you're going to know that that charger will work. That's going to be as much an issue as just the lack of chargers. So I'm going to agree and disagree with you. So for EV drivers, <laughs> yes, absolutely. When we look at non-EV drivers, reliability isn't very much on their radar. Some people talk about it, but it's really, are there enough chargers? Are they where I want to go? So it's really that visibility of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the experience that you've had and that I've had. You know, like, It's got to work when you show up or else things go south really quickly. I think that's starting to get out there because yeah. we're seeing more studies, more, more of us are writing about it. I, I want to change the subject just slightly. Uh, in the last few months, we have seen a number of automakers start to say, okay, how do we change our strategy a little bit? Mm -hmm. GM's a great example. Mary Barra, nothing but ice until we evolve totally to EVs. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, plug-in hybrids. Mm -hmm. And we're hearing that more and more. Uh, I was just with some of the Hyundai folk on a, on a test drive of the uh, Santa Fe, and I know that they're looking at adding more plug-in hybrids. What are you seeing? How does that differentiate? Are, they, are consumers aware? Is it a viable alternative, a potentially viable alternative, or what? So there's a really interesting gap between when you ask consumers, are plug-in hybrids a good step between gas cars and EVs, and a majority say yes. And then you ask them, are you gonna buy a plug-in hybrid? And that number shrinks substantially. So we have seen growth and in interest in plug-in hybrids over the last four years, but it's only about 16% or so of the market that says that oh. they're interested in plug-in hybrids. And I think part of the, the thought process that people have is, they recognize that a plug-in hybrid, you've got two powertrains in there. And so they're thinking about, you know, one, what's the cost impact? Two, what's the maintenance and reliability impact? And is that something that I really want to get into? So while there certainly is a use case for plug-in hybrids, and I think pickup trucks is a great use case uh, for what it's worth um, for, you know, towing and hauling and things like that. And there are consumers that are going to be more comfortable in a plug-in hybrid. Uh, that a lot of people are thinking about it in the sense of, I'm going to stick with gas until I'm comfortable with EV. I personally am not going to do that half step where I've got the option of both plug and gas because it's just too complex. And I, you know, I see the future as EV. That's where I'm going to go. But I need to be comfortable with that first. Is it changing? In terms of more and more people thinking that uh, thinking of PHEVs is viable. Uh, there are more, but again, the growth has not been the same as what we've seen in pure EVs. Or in pure hybrids. Yeah, what, yeah. what about non-plug hybrids? I mean, they're, they're outselling EVs, so. They are. And we have seen a growth in interest in hybrids as well. So that's, you know, if we look at the growth trajectory of BEV and hybrids non-plug-in, they're very similar. Hybrids started from a much higher 
base than EV did. And then uh, plug-in hybrids, again, we've seen some growth in the interest in that, but it's not been as significant as for hybrids or for full BEVs. Well, let's talk pickups more because yeah. I'd, I'd love to get your, your uh, input on this. The Detroit 3 know their pickup buyer inside out and backwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they know their truck customers better than any other segment. And yet they've gone with electric trucks. And uh, you tell me, but it seems to me that pickup buyers are the most conservative in the market. They are the least likely to go electric. And it seems to me curious that these companies that seemingly know this customer inside out and backwards decided to go with electric trucks, which to me, at, at least the first generation, look like they're not going to sell very well. I like mine. Well, yeah, yeah but see, I, 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 I cut forward some slack in the sense that it knew it had to rush to market. Instead of doing a clean sheet design like GM and, and Stellantis are doing, it rushed an F-150 to the market because it wanted to be. There. So I'm cutting them some slack because uh, they didn't go. They are working on a clean sheet design, though. So, I mean, they're, they're back in the the same boat. And, you know, what has Ford said? 75% of the people buying a Lightning have never had a truck before. Yeah. They're, they're not truck buyers coming into the EV segment. So what's your outlook for how this goes, these well, electric pickups? John, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head is that truck buyers are the most anti-EV of any group. I mean, there are some EV and tenders in there, but it's the smallest uh, percentage of, of any segments and tenders. And I, I was going to mention, but you brought it up, the idea that you know Ford has seen an influx of non-truck buyers. Look, I'm not a truck guy. Driving the Lightning made me giggle. There are very few cars that make me giggle, yeah. right? Um, you take something that big and you huck it around a corner and floor it, and that thing just goes. I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's impressive. It drives right? fabulous. It does. It's a great truck. Um, but again, this is coming from a non-truck guy, right? Right. Um, and, you know, I've talked to EV truck owners that have have towed with their trucks and it works great. I mean, that torque is fantastic for towing. Problem is your range gets completely killed when you're towing. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that gets you back into the cycle of, well, I'm doing these road trips and how do I charge and are there pull through spots or do I have to unhook my trailer every time? I mean, it just gets into this whole logistical nightmare. So, you know, my best guess, and, and you all probably have a better insight on this than I do, you know, given your coverage of the industry, but it seems like the move to electric pickup trucks was, well, we've got a lot of margin in these trucks, so we can eat some cost by making them electric and still sell them. But it, the, the market's just not there yet. For I, them. I think their other thinking was, look, uh, EV is a race to scale, right? If, if we can get to manufacturing scale, we can get, uh, you know, to our break even, we can start to make right. money. What's our biggest volume? It's pickups, so we should go that way. But it seems to me they, they, they took their eye off the ball when it comes to the customer of that truck. And, and so a, a follow-up question on that is, is Ram getting it right with a range extender? Will the traditional pickup buyer say, oh, yeah, if it's got an engine, then I'll go electric? I, it remains to be seen. I'm cautiously optimistic, though, because I think it addresses that range issue with towing. Uh, you get the performance of the electric motor, but you aren't hampered by the fact that, you know, a trailer adds all sorts of aerodynamic drag in the same way. I think the key probably will be the butts and seats, as we were talking about previously, right? If the Ram buyer gets in and, and understands the performance of the vehicle, then they can be sold on it. If they just look at it and say, you know, something with a plug, not really interested, then they're not. So I, I, I'm really fascinated to see what's going to happen with that vehicle. And we'll have Mickey Bly on the show next week, the head of uh, powertrain for Stellantis, who will be able to tell us about he, he that. He will tell us all about the, the range extender, I'm sure. That's right, Gary. Absolutely. So talk to us about the, the behavior change that is necessary for people to have an EV as their daily driver. How much of a challenge is it for someone to go from owning a gasoline vehicle to owning an electric vehicle? And what is the willingness that you see as you survey people for them to say, you know, I got to do all that in order to make this work. So I think there's a couple of ways of answering that. The first is kind of the initial setup, right? Which is, you know, how do I charge it at home? And we see that as a big 
psychological as much as anything barrier to many consumers, right? You're buying this vehicle, but then there's this whole secondary decision set and costs associated with, well, which EVSE do I get? Who do I hire to install it? How much is that going to run, right? So just kind of the the actual setup piece is daunting. And we've been really gratified to see a number of OEMs just bundle the EVSE and installation with the vehicle. It takes that secondary pain point out of the picture, right? Here you go. You're ready to go from day one, right? So we think that's a, a really good thing. As far as kind of the day-to-day -day behavior after that, um, there's really not a whole lot of change other than, you know, missing the, the gas station. I think the bigger issue is with road trips um, and with the psychology of how you charge the vehicle. So on road trips, it's, um, you know, as we talked about before, knowing where the chargers are, knowing how to use them. The other issue, and this kind of comes back to the reliability, is that, you know, if you pull up to a gas station and a pump's not working, there's usually another pump there, or if the whole station's out for some reason, you're going to go back and get gas in another week anyway. So you've got a lot of bites at that apple mm -hmm. versus if you're doing a road trip once or twice a year and you run into an, a station that's down entirely, you can't get any charge. You know, that's one of maybe two experiences you have with the fast charging network. And that's that's a pretty negative event. Right. So so that's one thing that, again, buyers need to get some comfort with. And then the psychology of charging you know, going for many, and not everyone fills their gas car this way, but, you know, many people will run it till it's a quarter tank or whatever it is. They'll fill it back up and repeat the cycle. You don't need to do that with an EV, right? You only need as much charge as what gets you to the next place you can charge. So it doesn't, you don't need to go zero to 100 or 25% mm -hmm. to 100 or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's a shift in mindset for many people. And we've run into this, you know, when we go to a charging station and we see the people that say, well, I'm waiting for a hundred. Well, where are you going next? Oh, I'm going 50 miles up the road. Well, <laughs> you're probably good to go now, right? Yeah. Um, so that mentality shift is something new for many people. Um, and it, it just takes a while to kind of get comfortable with that. So another area that the industry has to deal with is the fact that there are, what, 50 million plus people that don't have the ability to put in a charger at their home. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing some changes. There's a few uh, a few parking lot companies, Parking Inc. or whatever it is out of Philadelphia, claims to be the largest operator of, of parking structures in the United States and Canada. They're starting to put it in. But how much of a problem will it be to get people who will never be able to charge at home, at least where they're living right now? For right now, not a problem. And here's why we actually, we've heard that sentiment a lot from folks. And so we actually did a study last year looking at uh, EV owners and EV intenders who live in multifamily units. So people who inherently can't install uh, a charger where they live. And we wanted to understand, you know, where they were at on this question. And as you would expect, they said, you know, if I could charge where I live, that'd be most convenient. But they said, you know, I see chargers around and if I buy an EV, I know where I can go. I can walk to a charger and, you know, get the charge that I need. And we actually saw that it's it's slight, but it's real that there are both more EV owners that live in multifamily than in single family. And there are more EV intenders than whoa, live wait, in whoa, multifamily. Whoa, whoa. Say wait. that again. OK, yeah, I, that is that's mind. Blo say it again. That's yeah. exactly the opposite of what I would have expected. So as a and this is by percentage, not total number, but there are more uh, EV owners as a percentage of people in multifamily and more EV intenders in that live in multifamily. So you're saying people in apartment buildings and, and things like today, that, which is the greater today, percentage of Which them. is exactly the opposite is what we thought, yes. right? We thought right. it would be that, hey, I can't charge at home and so I'm not going to buy an EV and I'm not going to be interested in an EV. But then if you step back and think about it, where a lot of these apartment units are, are in urban uh, or suburban areas. So they're denser. That's where a lot of the EV infrastructure is. And again, when you look at why they're buying an EV and why they're not terribly concerned, it's because they're seeing that infrastructure, again, the visibility of the infrastructure. And many of them are saying, if I buy an EV or if I own an EV and I can't charge where I, I live, I can go somewhere, I can walk, I can, you know, hang out at a coffee shop while it charges. What I, I can figure this out, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as much of a barrier as people think it is. That being said, 
I do think from a convenience angle, getting more charging installed at multifamily, I mean, nobody that we talked to said, oh, I'd rather not charge at home, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so but you guys say over 70% of BEV charging happens at home. Mm -hmm. So if most of the owners live in places where they can't charge at home, so it, does, it, as it, what I'm saying is as a percentage, there are more multifamily dwellers that own EVs than single family owners that own an EV. So the absolute numbers skew towards single family in terms of how many people own an EV, but as a percentage of the people that live in those different housing mm -hmm. types, it's higher in multifamily. Um, and, you know, again, you know, for the, the people who are charging at home, most of them are single family. 85% of new car buyers are single, fa single family homeowners, right? So, I mean, that, that just sways it in that direction that you can install it at home. But as you point out, Paul, there are plenty of people who don't live in a situation where they can install an EV charger and, and we need to accommodate for that. But, you know, public charging infrastructure investment essentially accommodates for that right All now. Right. So I have to come up with another question related to that. Okay. Where are the other surprises? I mean, we, we expect that California <laughs> is, as you said before, what, 25% uh, people in California are buying EVs. There's got to be some other surprises, some little areas that you wouldn't expect EVs to be strong and that they are, or maybe vice versa. Hmm. I'll, I'll jump in and get your reaction. Yeah, Texas please. and Florida. Now, not the full state. Yes. But, re you know, so Austin, I hear, is a hotbed of EV activity, yeah. like you might expect. Yeah. And places of Florida, very conservative state, but also places of a very hotbed uh, at EV activity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. Those are big EV markets. New York and Illinois would round out the top five with California there. Um, and, you know, again, I think some of it comes down to that that urban uh, uh, sort of rural divide, right? You've got a lot of infrastructure in the urban areas, including in Texas and Florida, and that that confidence that seeing public charging infrastructure brings is huge. That can't be overstated. Well, one so, of the things you guys looked at was was this public charging that if John runs a store and Paul runs a store and John's store has charging, people are going to go there and spend more money mm -hmm. with John than they will with Paul. Yeah. So, so how important is that uh, for the EV driver? It's a, it's nice, right? It's, it's nice to have additional uh, options to charge. We actually think that there is a competitive advantage to retailers and in installing charging. Um, now, part of the the trick that they've got to figure out, or the business model really that they've got to figure out, is that it's more attractive it's, if it's a DC fast charger than if it's a level two. And DC fast chargers, of course, cost quite a bit more money to install than a level two and does. Operate. And to operate, yes. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a balance there, but um, yeah, we do see that uh, consumers say if there's you know a choice between two retail outlets, I'm going to go to the one with an EV charger. If I've got an EV, um, I'm likely to spend more time there, uh, and that should translate into additional dollars for the retailer. So, I want to go back to the traditionalists, the people who say, yeah. "No way in hell, yeah. I don't want anything to do with them." How big? of a uh, percentage are they of the car buying public? And here's why I'm asking. Yeah. As you know, in the next couple of weeks, the EPA is going to release its emission standards, greenhouse gas standards mm -hmm. for 2027 and beyond. And even though the Biden administration has said it's going to give the industry a little bit more wiggle room, there ain't much wiggle room there at all. And so we're going to, looks like, we'll see what the EPA comes out with, emission standards that will require 67% market share by 2032. Mm -hmm. So how big a cohort is the people who say, no way in hell will I ever take one? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. So the traditionalist, that persona specifically is around about 17% of the market. So, you know, it's, it's oh, so smaller, that's relatively but sm I thought but, it was a bigger group, but the second way I'm going to answer that is that we've got a group that we call EV resistant, which includes most of the traditionalists, but some of the other personas as well. Um, and those are people who, you know, they're probably not going to buy in their next buying cycle, maybe two buying cycles before they uh, they go down the road of buying an EV. And that's about 38% of the market. So, you know, when you start saying, okay, 62% has to be EV. Well, if you got 38% of the market, that's probably not there yet. That's going to be a challenge. What would it take to change their minds? 
some people, their minds are not going to be changed, right? They're, they're just dyed in the wool. They're going to buy an ice car until they just can't anymore. Um, but again, I think a lot of what it comes down to is some of the practical considerations, right? We've got to get to price parity between ICE and EV. We've got to have the right models, brands, and segments available for people. Um, we've got to make sure that charging infrastructure is ubiquitous, reliable, and visible, right? Um, a lot of this is just really reassurance. Again, you know, you, you mentioned it, Gary, before the idea gas stations are everywhere, right? Um, people don't have that view of EV charging. And until they get to that point where they view EV charging as being everywhere, they're not going to have the confidence that an EV can serve them in the same way that a gas car can. So, you know, it's it's a lot of just block and tackling, John, to, to get people there. So, so Casey, <clears throat> truck buyers are very practical. They're very conservative, but they're very practical. Yeah. The truck's a tool, yeah. right? And if you can solve the range issue with towing with a pickup, I mean, why would you not go with an electric truck? I mean, to your point, the yeah. torque is fantastic. I mean, you can tow so much more easily with anything. And there's the, the built-in power points in the, the bed or so the front. Yeah, side, yeah, exactly. You got power right on board, right? Yeah. Would just solving the range thing with towing get the resistant, the anti-EV people to, to go, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. I'll, I'll get one of these. It, it might. Um, and the reason that I'm I'm hedging, and let me add one more data point, is that truck buyers and those EV resistant, they also use battery operated other stuff at a much higher rate than everyone else. All the right? power tools. All the power tools, exactly, right? So, I mean, they're, they're used to battery operated stuff, right? Um, but I think part of part of the equation here, and we saw this a couple of years ago, and it it certainly continued, is that there's a political polarization that's happening. So, you know, yes, there is the practical practical concern if we can solve the towing range issue, great, that addresses that, and there's a lot of other practical benefits of a BEV in a truck platform. But if you know, driving an EV screams I'm liberal, and that's not part of your identity. <laughs> That's a really tough sell. So, so sort of sticking with the political thing a little bit. Um, so, to what extent does the fact that there's the potential seventy five hundred dollar tax credit play into people's decision making regarding EVs? And do you see the possibility that if that goes away, that suddenly this acceptance of EVs will not be as great as you might anticipate it to Well, be. that's one of the reasons we saw the slowdown last year is because we saw the new tax uh, law come into effect and mm -hmm. a lot of models lost eligibility, right? Um, so, I, I mean, I think the, the answer is that it plays in quite a bit. Um, you know, we talked about price parity between ICE and EV. And so that tax credit basically buys down the difference between ICE and EV. And that's where buyers today want it to be, right, is, is they're not willing to pay more for the EV. More, moreover, we've got examples in China and Germany where EV uh, incentives were throttled back. And it, yeah, sales exactly. Went down exactly. Yeah. So what are you seeing? Maybe this is outside your data collection area, but uh, what are you seeing in terms of the shift? from purchase to lease, since that's that giant loop, loophole in the uh, IRA. Yeah, uh, so it's kind of outside of my area, um, right? We're, we're not looking at the, the actuals. What was really interesting is when we looked at this a couple of years ago, we saw a shift between EV owners who very much, uh, well, at least compared to uh, kind of the average car buyer, um, were on the, the lease train uh, to EV intenders that mirrored more what the split between lease and finance looked like. So at the time we looked at it and we said, okay, you know, we're going to see a little bit of a, a decline in leasing EVs. But yes, that loophole is, is certainly... It's moving uh, people back into lease. I think it's moving people back into a lease because again, they're looking at the, the cost parity. And when we ask people about the tax credit and what would happen if they were shopping for a vehicle and thought that it could get the tax credit and then found out that it didn't, we saw a pretty big chunk of them around about 30 percent that said i'd go buy another vehicle that had the tax credit available mm -hmm. so i mean it's definitely shifting buyer behavior in terms of being able to apply that tax credit to a vehicle did anybody say i'll buy a ice car yes 25 percent said that wow yeah mm. oh, what? So, so so basically so so i mean doesn't that seem to indicate that this is really an art you know let's take tesla out people buy teslas 
tax or no tax. But it's it's like an artificial market. I mean, if suddenly the government said, I'll give you 7,500 bucks to buy a muscle car, we'd see muscle cars exploding, right? <laughs> I like that, Gary. Well, we're going to we're going to get that, Gary. We're going to have seventy five hundred available on on the new Dodge. I'm I'm talking about cars with Hemi engines. Paul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think when we look at EVs, they cost more to produce, right? And so, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the cost curve, right, John? You were talking about you want to buy down the production costs essentially by getting to scale. And that's that's where we are right now is is trying to get to scale so that cost can come down. The delta between EV and ICE has continued to come down over the years. I think, you know, eighteen months ago it was twelve hundred dollars or twelve thousand dollars, something like that. Then seventy five hundred, then uh, five thousand. So that gap is closing. We're getting to price parity to where we wouldn't necessarily need the tax credit. Uh, and if someone says, okay, two comparable vehicles and one's ICE and one's EV, I'm going to go with the EV, you know, as long as the price is the same. Um, right now, the price isn't the same. And so you need that that government support to kind of get people over uh, the hump, particularly the buyers today, because again, they're not going to go out and spend more for something that they perceive as uncertain or less or whatever. Casey, so, what do you think would happen with this $25,000 car that Tesla's been talking about? And you. Ford's got this Skunk Works program yeah. to do the same sort of thing. And Toyota's got this Bev factory that presumably is doing something similar. Is that going to move the needle? Because, you know, my argument is that the general American public is not looking for a small, cheap car. Mm -hmm. that, you know, what I'm saying is, they want a Chevy Suburban sized vehicle that goes 400 miles, charges in five minutes, burns rubber across the intersection and costs $25,000. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it ultimately is going to depend on the product, right? So, you know, all things being equal, if the cost is less, it's going to sell well. But to your point, if it's, you know, a compact hatchback, um, I might buy one because I'm a weirdo, but, uh, you know, that's not the uh, that's not the car buying public. Right? right. And we've seen time and time again that a compelling product is really important for buyers. So you got to get the price right, but you've got to get the styling and the form factor right. You got to get the practicality, the range, the charging speed. It's all of the above. It's not pick one and exclude the others. I mean, my comment when um, when Rivian unveiled the R2, assuming that they can actually get to production and you know, stay around that long as we were talking before the show um, is that, you know, if they can get that thing to production, they're going to sell a ton of those because it is a compelling mid-sized SUV and it's coming in at a price point that's lower than the average new car transaction. They're going to mint money with that thing. Um, so that's what we need to be doing is really good product at a good price point. So, so maybe this is outside what you guys do, but you know, this, this brings up the point, you know, you have companies like Rivian and, mm -hmm. you know, we're hearing that Fisker is having financial problems, yeah. Lucid's having financial problems. So do consumers feel more comfortable buying a lightning or, or buying a Silverado EV because they come from General Motors and Ford than they do from a startup company? And we'll take again take generally Tesla out, take yes. Tesla out. So uh, when we ask people where they would prefer to buy an EV from, um, looking at the market in its entirety, mm -hmm. a majority say that they'd prefer to buy from an established OEM, a Ford, a you know Stellantis, whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a handful that say that they prefer prefer to buy from a specialist EV. And then there's you know a bunch of people that are kind of like ah, I don't really care, right? That does swing a little bit more towards preferring the EV specialist the closer you get towards EV ownership. So EV owners, they're more likely to say that they'd prefer the EV specialist. Still prefer an established OEM at a higher <laughs> rate, bless you. Um, Thank you. EV intenders, they're a little bit less likely than EV owners. Um, so there's kind of more openness for newer brands among people the closer that they get. But again, uh, the majority prefer to get it from established brands. That being said, again, it comes back to the product, right? So if someone comes to market with something that's compelling, which Tesla has done, right? Um, that is a compelling vehicle and people will kind of get over there. Well, I'd prefer to buy it from, you know, a, a GM um, and say, this is just better, right? I'd like to go back to what you said about uh, Rivian mm -hmm. hitting the sweet spot of the market because Jim Farley has said, we don't want to do 
a two row crossover. That segment is so jam packed. We'd rather go elsewhere. It is, but that's where most of the buyers are is they, they want to buy a compact or mid-sized SUV. Uh, and there are some EV products in that space, some better than others. Um, but you know, that's one of the segments where you can compete for share, you know, truck buyers, um, you know, th there are fewer truck intenders, even though the truck segment, uh, you know, does quite a bit of, of volume. Um, it, it's that SUV space where you've got a lot of opportunity. The other area that there's uh, opportunity that we have not seen product uh, is in a mainstream large car. So mm. think like a Chevy Impala sized uh, vehicle. There's really not anything there. And there's a decent chunk of buyers that are interested in EVs in that space. Really? Yeah. Even more so than the non-existent market in uh, ICE? <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, if you're putting your bets on things, it's it's the SUVs and crossovers, right? But, you know, when we start going down the list, the one that's really missing the product is is that large car segment. So the, the white space, as they talk about in product planning. Exactly, yeah. yes. So yes. we keep talking, Tesla is that, 800 pound gorilla and yeah. it's come up so many times it's sort of we expect it it's the benchmark in so many ways there has to be vulnerability what, what are you seeing that if if elon musk didn't buy his own hype but actually started looking in, at stuff that could be scary what would he what would he find in terms of things like that should things that, that should he scare should be looking at he should yeah. be looking at and things that should downright scare him. Well, boy, he should be looking in the mirror first and foremost. Um, I mean, we have seen, <laughs> uh, you know, when we look at people, uh, Elon Musk turns them off from Tesla, right? Um, yeah. yeah, and and it was really interesting because we look we we talked earlier about kind of the political leanings of. Um, uh, car buyers and kind of how they think of EVs. What we saw when Elon Musk started being very vocal politically is that conservatives liked him a lot more, but they were more no more likely than they were a year before to be interested in an EV. So yeah, he got pats on the back, but he wasn't growing the market. Whereas liberals were more likely to be interested in buying an EV, and they liked him less, and were less likely to buy a Tesla. Right. So, so looking in the mirror is one one thing. That brand image is is uh, key. I think the other piece is around the product. Right. So they've got really good product, but it's also old product. Right. So as you have vehicles like the Ionic Six entering the market, uh, or the R2 if it makes it to market. And people say, okay, I've gotten a, a credible alternative to Tesla here. Um, I, I think we're going to see a shift away from Tesla. So those would be the two things that I'd, I'd point them towards. And, and Casey, when you say it's old product, you're really talking styling. Because Tesla updates its its vehicles, not just with over-the-air yeah. updates. They have running changes where they keep updating it. Yeah. And, and so we had Larry Burns here on the show who used to run R&D at General Motors. Mm -hmm. And what he's pushing for is get the industry back to being a fashion industry. And I, I wonder if that's what you're identifying here is that is Tesla's weakness, is that uh, there are a lot of other competitors coming now with really good styling, mm -hmm. you know, head turning styling. Yeah. And as you know, one stylist once told me a long time ago is he says, of course, styling matters. If people don't even notice your car, how do they know they want to buy it? Yeah. Well, you look at something like, you know, the Model X, which has been out for forever. Right. Um, and then you look at the EV9 and the EV9 looks fresh. Right. Um, it, it stands out in a way that a Model X just simply doesn't. Right. So. So, yeah, I mean, well, be I think careful how you say that, because a Model X in Michigan is still a standout product. It's just so rare. In California, it's like, so what? They're right. everywhere. Fair enough, right? Different parts of the country, North Dakota, different situation than Texas. Yeah, and right. Yeah, no, that totally fair point. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think when you look at, at the buyers, um, again, it comes down to having compelling product. There is sort of a... a desire to buy from an established OEM. And so Tesla mm. isn't, Tesla is the default EV. It is not necessarily the default car. And so if you're looking for, you know, a good car and you're considering an EV and you find something in a Hyundai showroom or, you know, a Chevy showroom or, you know, where, wherever, then you're likely to consider that in a way that you may not with Tesla. Mm. Hey, look, we're going to have to wrap it up. But Casey, it's been fantastic having you on the show. This has, this been, has been a fun. terrific discussion here and, and really good information. Thank you, John. Yeah. And Paul, thanks for coming on the show with this us today. This is a great too. show. This I enjoyed really this.
And then, Gary, we'll do another show next week, and we'll Let's talk about it. extended range. We will. Okay. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey.